this is Rizwan Azim and I will be taking you through the air conditioning part of the course in refrigeration and air conditioning from this week onwards up to now you have already gone through the refrigeration part and if you look at the course CLOs co CLO number one applies to what you have covered so far in refrigeration and from this point onwards we will start with topics which relate to CLOs 2 and 3 and then finally CLO 4 refers to the contents of your practicals. The CLOs or topics are also provided to you separately for convenience and if we look at the first topic in CLO 2 that is psychometry and that is what we are going to start with uh, before we move on to that uh, when we study air conditioning uh, basic thermodynamics concepts will be required in addition at some point we will also make use of your knowledge of heat transfer and fluid mechanics so now let's move on and again remind ourselves of how can we differentiate between refri refrigeration and air conditioning refrigeration involves removal of heat from a region which it, uh, uh, is at a relatively lower temperature and then rejecting that heat in a region which is at a higher temperature and to achieve that and satisfy the laws of ther thermodynamics we need a net power input into the system air conditioning on the other hand does not r restrict itself to cooling only depending on your requirement air conditioning could be providing heating for example during the winter season in addition to the temperature there are other factors which are also accounted for in air conditioning for example the rel relative humidity the velocity of motion of air within the conditioned space radiant energy levels the amount of contamination that is tolerable and even how much noise you attenu attenuation is required according to your environment and now we move on to the first topic that is psychrometry psychrometry is the study of the thermodynamic properties of moist air moist air simply air in which water vapor is present and we can consider the moist air to be a binary mixture dry air and water vapor and for the typical conditions of air conditioning that we come across each of these components can be considered to behave as an ideal gas and the justification for that is that the air that is the dry air behaves like a perfect gas because its temperature is high relative to its saturation temperature and for water vapor we can assume it to behave like an ideal gas because its pressure is low relative to its saturation pressure and once we assume that ideal gas behavior is applicable to these constituents we can apply the relevant mathematical equations that are already known to us to find out or estimate various properties of the moist air the typical properties that we will come across when we study air conditioning are starting with the mixture pressure the mixture pressure we are very well aware of this basic equation that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is the sum of the ideal pressure of those constituent gases and because we have a binary mixture the total pressure is the sum of the partial pressure of air and the partial pressure of water vapor in that air and we are using the symbols uh, subscripts A and V to designate the two constituents air and water the humidity ratio is 
defined as the mass of water vapor per unit mass of dry air and we are using the symbol capital W to designate that and in a SI system it will have units of kilogram per kilogram dry air and when we write it as a numerical value kilogram of dry air is shortened to kg dA and because we are saying that both the gases behave like uh, ideal gases we can use the ideal gas equation to designate the mass of water vapor which will be equal to PV upon RT and similarly for dry air because the two constituent gases are occupying the same volume and the are at the same temperature these terms will cancel out in the numerator and in the denominator and we will be left with the ratio PV by RV divided by PA by RA and R is the gas constant which is the universal gas constant divided by the molecular mass of that particular gas over here and what we can do is substitute the values of the molecular masses of air and water vapor and the universal gas constant in this equation and we will get a resultant e expression for the humidity ratio which is 0.622 times the partial pressure of water vapor divided by the partial pressure of air which is the total pressure minus the partial pressure of water vapor in the air relative humidity I'll just read off the definition first and then try to explain it it is the ratio of the mole fraction of water vapor in moist air sample to the mole fraction of the water vapor in a saturated moist air sample at the same temperature and pressure if you have a sample of moist air and if you add water vapor to that sample the partial pressure of water vapor in that sample will increase and you can keep on adding this water vapor into the air sample but you will reach ultimately a point where the air will not be able to take up any more water vapor and we will say that the air has become saturated so if we dis uh, differentiate between the two states then you will have a maximum possible vapor pressure at the saturation state at a given temperature and total pressure and again we can use the ideal gas equation that PV is equal to number of moles into RT where R it will be the universal gas constant so the number of moles will be PV upon RT and if we take the ratio when the moist air sample is not saturated and divided by the number of moles when the moist air sample is saturated again the universal gas constant the volume and the temperatures will cancel out because they are the same and only the partial pressures will be left and that ratio will give us the relative humidity the relative humidity expressed as a percentage will be PV upon PV sat in 200 and obviously it will vary in numerical value from 0 to 1 or in as a percentage from 0 to 100 percent if there is no moisture present in the air it's completely dry then the relative humidity will be zero and if the air is completely saturated then P if PV sat becomes equal PV becomes equal to PV sat then phi will be equal to 1 or 100 percent the enthalpy of the moist air sample again will be the sum of the enthalpies of dry air and water vapor contained in the air and the total enthalpy we have the equation we are designating the total enthalpy by capital H which will be the sum of the total of uh, the enthalpies of air and water vapor if I want to use specific enthalpy I can find out the enthalpy as a product of the mass times the specific enthalpy and we can do that for air as well as water vapor and the resultant equation that we have is capital H is equal to MAHA plus MV HV now if I divide 
the right hand side and the left hand side throughout by MA what I will get is the specific enthalpy of the moist air and that will be energy per unit mass of dry air on the right hand side MA will cancel out in the first term giving us HA and in the second term on the right hand side we will get the ratio MV by MA that is mass of water vapor divided by mass of dry air and that we have from our previous definition is the humidity ratio and we can appropriately replace MV by MA by the humidity ratio W and as I said it will be having units in the SI systems of kilojoule per kilogram dry air. We can make a further simplification and that is HA can be approximated as the product of the specific heat of dry air multiplied by the temperature in degree Celsius and to do that we will assume that the reference state is 0 degree C where HA is 0. Now with that selection of reference state HA can be replaced by CPA times T. CPA is the specific heat of dry air which is 1 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. The temperature over here will be in degree Celsius. And the other simplification that you can see over here is that HV has been taken to be approximately the same as HG and there must be a justification for that as well which we can observe if we look at the Mollier chart. If you look at the Mollier chart I've shown you two points in the Mollier chart. One lies on the saturated vapor line and the other is in the superheated region. If our actual state is in the superheated region we can see that at the constant temperature the value of the enthalpy is almost the same over in the superheated region at this point and at the saturation saturated vapor line because of the almost flat constant temperature line so that is justifiable assumption and the what uh, it helps us is that we can find out the value of AG easily from property tables and once we have that expression we can simply find out the specific enthalpy of the moist air sample CPAT plus W times HG. Specific volume of the moist air again straightforward application of the ideal gas equation for both air and dry air and for water vapor. The next thing that we will look at are temperatures and when we study psychrometry uh, we will not work with one temperature but we will work with three temperatures and we should be able to differentiate between these three temperatures. The first of all, uh, one of these is known as the dry bulb temperature and that is the temperature that you will measure by using in an ordinary thermometer that is the air temperature uh, if you are using a mercury in glass or a liquid in glass thermometer or a thermocouple or some other temperature measuring device. We use the word dry assuming that the sensor of the thermometer is almost dry without having any liquid present around it and that is again justifiable. The wet bulb temperature again I will first read out the definition and then we'll try to see how to conceptualize the def definition that we have just read. The temperature at which water evaporating into moist air at a given dry bulb temperature and humidity ratio can bring to saturation adiabatically at the same pressure. What is implied is that we have a moist air sample which is not saturated and that moist air sample is brought into contact with water and water evaporates into the air stream and eventually this evaporation will lead to a point where the air becomes saturated and it is done such that the entire process is adiabatic. What we can think of is a large chamber which is insulated or isolated from the surroundings 
and unsaturated moist air enters the chamber and flows over water which is contained in that chamber and as the water flows in that chamber liquid water which evaporates into the air stream will gradually increase the humidity ratio of the moist air okay. now this process because the chamber is isolated from the surroundings and we are evaporating water there is a need for providing the latent heat of vaporization so and because it cannot come from outside that heat of vaporization is extracted partially from the air stream and partially from the water which leads to a drop in the temperature of moist air and water and this process will continue until we reach the point where the air becomes saturated and no further evaporation will be possible and then the temperature that you measure at that point for air and water will be the same and that is known as the wet bulb temperature and again to maintain steady state conditions we will also ensure that we are providing water to the chamber in, in an amount which is equal to the rate at which is evaporating to the air stream and at the same temperature we can s look at this schematic diagram of the process that we have just looked at state one is where we have the unsaturated air coming into this insulated chamber the air st stream as it as you move along the chamber will gain water vapor from the water contained in the chamber its humidity ratio will increase and there will be a decrease in the temperature until you reach the end of the chamber at which point we assume it has become saturated now why do we need uh, such a long ch chamber of almost infinite length to achieve this uh, condition of saturation of the air that is because the rate of evaporation is also dependent on the concentration difference between the air stream and the concentration of water vapor at the surface of water so this is ma maximum at the start and as this concentration difference starts to decrease the rate of evaporation of water into the air stream will also decrease and as you move further and further down the stream that rate of evap evaporation will keep on decreasing so theoretically you will need almost an infinitely long chamber to achieve saturation conditions the water <coughs> the the temperature difference between the dry bulb temperature and the wet bulb temperature is known as the wet bulb temperature and uh, from a knowledge of these two temperatures it is possible to estimate the humidity ratio or relative humidity of the air that sample which you are looking at and that is why this is an important parameter in air conditioning practically if, if you want to do it we wouldn't have a huge instrument it becomes impractical to have a infinitely long a very large size instrument to measure the wet bulb temperature but there are instruments from which using uh, uh, using which we can find out the wet bulb temperature and that instrument is known as a psychrometer and uh, i will show you two commonly used types of psychrometer uh, bef uh, before that let me just uh, uh, go to the third temperature that is known as the dew point temperature if you have a moist air sample and I want to keep the pressure and humidity ratio unchanged if I want to keep the temperature the humidity ratio and the pressure unchanged and still saturate the air what I can do is I can reduce the temperature of the air until the moisture in the air separates out as fog or dew now that temperature at which the moisture will separate out from the air sample at a constant pressure and humidity ratio is known as the dew point temperature 
I will now come to the psychrometer and show you the two instruments that are quite commonly used. One is a manual instrument shown over here which is known as the sling psychrometer. You can see it has two thermometers, one at the top whose bulb you can see and it is basically exposed to the surrounding air. This and this measures the dry bulb temperature. The temperature measured by the second thermometer over here is the wet bulb temperature and you can see the bulb is not open to the air. It is covered with the absorbent material and this is connected to a reservoir in which you fill water and that water that you fill in over here will ensure that this thermometer has its bulb surrounded by a wetted absorbent material. Holding this handle you will then rotate this upper casing and after a while you will s uh, one will notice the difference in the two temperatures. This will the temperature measured by the upper thermometer will be the dry bulb temperature which will be higher and the one measured by the lower thermometer will be the wet bulb temperature which will be lower and I will show you a video, video how it is properly done. The other is the uh, is a digital psychrometer and we have looking at it over here it has a display on, from on which you can see various properties like relative humidity, dry bulb temperature, wet bulb temperature, dew point temperature etc. and I will again show you a short video of this type of a psychrometer. So let's uh, start with the sling psychrometer. Hello, welcome to IOGS International's video lesson. Today, you are going to learn about the use of a whirling hygrometer. The whirling hygrometer is also known as a sling psychrometer, and it is mostly used by coating inspectors to record the air temperature, relative humidity, and dew point. The hygrometer is comprised of two thermometers, which has one of the bulbs covered by a wick. The bulb covered by wick is known as a wet bulb, and the uncovered bulb is called the dry bulb. The instrument also has a reservoir. Before start using the hygrometer, a bit of preparation and precautions are needed, and these involve the following. Check that the wet bulb sensor is covered entirely by the wick. Fill the reservoir and saturate the wick of the wet bulb entirely with water. Several minutes may be needed for total saturation of the wick. Avoid touching the wick, because doing so may leave oil or dirt behind. Keep the dry bulb entirely dry. Be ecologically friendly by not whirling the hygrometer in direct sunlight or near the heat source. The correct technique for using a hygrometer is Face the wind and hold the handle of hygrometer well away from the body. Whirl the hygrometer rapidly and after 30 seconds stop the motion and quickly read the wet bulb temperature. Go back to whirling the hygrometer for another 10 seconds and then read the wet bulb temperature for the second time. Continue this system of whirling until three successive readings are the same or the wet bulb temperature becomes stable. When the temperature stabilizes, read and record first the wet bulb temperature. Next, read and record the dry bulb temperature. While reading the thermometers, keep your body, hands, and any warmer or colder objects as far away as possible from the thermometer bulbs. After the wet and dry bulb temperature is established, a psychrometric table or psychrometer calculator is utilized to ascertain relative humidity and dew point of the air. The psychrometric table needs wet bulb depression value. The wet bulb depression value is the difference between the dry and wet bulb temperatures. Both the dry bulb temperature and wet bulb depression are located on the vertical and horizontal axes, respectively, of the psychrometric tables. The point where the two temperatures cross indicates the relative humidity or dew point.
next we will look at the working of a digital psychrometer so this is the sensor of the psychrometer which is protected by a cap which can be closed and opened when the psychrometer is not in use it's closed and when you want to use the psychrometer you will open the cap and then start using it that is the display of the psychrometer and there are a number of buttons which you can see in the front this is the on off button f oblique c you can toggle between degree fahrenheit and degree celsius the wet bulb temperature wbt and dew is the dew point temperature hold if you are measuring changing values and you want to hold the value at a particular point you can press this button if you take several readings and you want to find out the maximum and, mi and minimum that uh, feature is also available okay when you turn on the psychrometer typically you will get the relative humidity and the dry bulb temperature and then you can also move on to other temperature readings now it's giving you the dew point temperature and that is identified by the latest dew on the left hand side of the temperature measurement and it's in degree fahrenheit similarly the wet bulb temperature will also be identified by the latest wbt this is quite a handy instrument and used to measure the desired values in the industry once you have used it you can close the sens uh, sensor cap yeah. and store it in its casing So the properties again just to summarize we had the total pressure the humidity ratio relative humidity the dry bulb temperature wet bulb temperature dew point temperature specific enthalpy of moist air specific volume and we have the relevant mathematical equations to calculate these but there is an alternate available to us and that is a graphical representation of these properties which is known as the psychrometric chart and it is quite a convenient tool for professionals in the HVAC industry and we will first look at what information is there on a typical psychrometric chart first thing that you have to keep in mind that the psychrometric chart is constructed for a specified value of bar barometric pressure that means the atmospheric pressure and what it means that if the barometric pressure changes the values in the psychrometric chart will also change and that is an important difference between the state of a moist air that it requires at least three independent properties to establish the state of moist air one of them being pressure once that pressure is established we can then choose any two other properties and the state of that moist air will be shown on the psychrometric chart on the horizontal axis you have the dry bulb temperature and you have the humidity ratio on the vertical axis humidity ratio is also referred to as absolute humidity and then there are some other curves and lines on this psychrometric chart for example we have a constant relative humidity line and you can see some constant relative humidity lines over here 
starting with let's say 20 percent then we have 40 60 80 percent and on the saturation line by default the humidity relative humidity must be 100 percent similarly on the horizontal axis where the humidity ratio is zero the relative humidity will be zero the constant specific volume lines are also shown which will have units of meter cube per kilogram dry air constant wet bulb temperature lines are shown over here and you can also read the enthalpy at the state at which you are interested in by using a scale in which the enthalpy is given as in term in units of kilojoule per kilogram dry air we will be basically using the ASHRAE psychrometric chart number one and it has certain uh, one additional feature which when we look at that chart I will show it to you it's a more detailed chart ASHRAE psychrometric chart number one means that there are other psychrometric charts produced by ASHRAE in fact in SI system there are seven psychrometric charts produced by ASHRAE psychrometric charts number one to four are for the normal for the standard <coughs> barometric pressure of 101325 pascals and but for different temperature ranges psychrometric chart number one is for the no normal temperature range of from 0 to 50 degrees C and it is the most commonly used psychrometric chart in the HVAC industry uh, the other three charts 5 6 and 7 are for different pressures as I said if you change the pressure the property values change so ASHRAE psychrometric charts number 5 6 and 7 are for different pressures and those pressures are specified in terms of the height above sea level that is 750 meters above sea level that will be ASHRAE psychrometric chart number 5 then 1500 meters above sea level psychrometric chart number 6 and 2250 meters above sea level that will be psychrometric chart number 7 and uh, 5, 6, 7 are for the normal temperature range of 0 to 50 degrees C. I will now show you the psychrometric chart that we will be making use of and you should be familiar with the use of this table is a more detailed table but it has the same information of course you can see the barometric pressure shown over here and first of all let's look at the psychrometric chart over here and try to point identify any differences between this chart and the one that we looked at earlier and there is one important difference that you should keep in mind over here and that is the units for the humidity ratio now the humidity ratio in the ASHRAE psychrometric charts is given in grams per kilogram dry air that is grams of water vapor per kilogram of dry air not in kilograms per kilogram dry air so if you are given a value of humidity ratio in kilogram per kilogram per dry air you have to multiply it by 1000 to convert it to grams per kilogram dry air and the other way around if you read a value from the chart which is in grams per kilogram dry air you have to divide it by 1000 to get the value in kilograms per kilogram dry air other than that we have the usual properties that we had looked at that means the relative humidity constant relative humidity lines are there the dotted lines are the constant wet bulb temperature lines and these lines are the constant specific volume lines the constant specific enthalpy lines and the scale from which you can read out the read the enthalpy so all these lines constant property lines are uh, clearly identified on the psychrometric chart in addition there is another tool available to us if you look at the top left hand side you can see a protractor with two scales one inside the other outside the utility of this tool we will look at when we study psychrometric processes and it is quite a useful tool uh, so we will leave it for the time being and we will come back to this protractor when we study psychrometric 
processes what I would like to do is just as an example try to find out some properties at a particular state of given to us for a moist air sample let's say we are given a moist air sample whose dry bulb temperature is 29 degrees C and its relative humidity is 30 percent I can mark that state over here let's look at this uh, we have this this is 29 degrees C and we move vertically upwards and where this line intersects the 30 percent relative humidity, humidity line that is the state of the dry air that is given to us and at this state I want to find out the values of the other properties and I will start with the humidity ratio so what I can do I can move on to the vertical axis from this state point and then read the value if you look at the values for the humidity ratio these are given in increments of 0.5 grams per kilogram dry air so, so this would be if this is 6 this is 6.5 then this is 7 this value is 7.5 that means corresponding to this state the humidity ratio is 7.5 grams per kilogram dry air which becomes 0 0.0075 kilogram per kilogram uh, per kilogram dry air the next property value that I want to find out for example is the wet bulb temperature and again you can see the constant wet bulb temperature lines over here we can refer to any of these dotted lines and we will make sure that we select a line which passes through our state point over here okay. so if you look at the values given to us this dotted line has a value of 20 degrees C the wet bulb temperature and this one is 15 so if this is 15 this will be 16 this is 17 you are slightly above 17 if this is 17 this is 18 this is probably around 17.2 degree Celsius so that will be the wet bulb temperature the specific volume we will try to find out next and just as we did earlier we will draw a line of constant specific volume which passes through the state point that we are interested in and you can see this is 0.86 this is 0.87 and we are almost at the center of this two values so it will be around 0.865 would be the specific volume units will be meter cube per kilogram dry air if you want a more accurate reading you can of course use a scale right now I'm just reading of these visually then the specific enthalpy and to find out the specific enthalpy uh, do not use the constant wet bulb temperature lines as a reference they appear to be parallel to the constant enthalpy lines but they are actually not if you look at it closely for example if I look at this line over here you can see the the two are almost parallel in this part of the psychometric chart but they are actually div diverging so if you want to read off the specific enthalpy you will have to draw a line which is parallel to, to any of these constant enthalpy lines that we are that we have over here and now we can read the specific enthalpy from the scale over here the scale has increments of 1 kilojoule per kilogram dry air so this will be around 
one kilojoule per kilogram dry air that will be the specific enthalpy at this state and lastly if I want to find out the dew point temperature remember the definition of dew point is that we need to keep the humidity ratio constant and bring the air to saturation and you can see how we can do that if we are at this state we will keep the humidity ratio constant that means we will move horizontally until we reach the saturation curve of the psychrometric chart so we start with that and we are on the saturation line and then what we can do we can drop a line vertically from this point and then read the value which will be the dew point temperature and that is around 9.2 3 or 9.4 degrees C if, we, if you look at 9.4 degrees C from over here and you can see that at the saturation line the dew point temperature the wet bulb temperature and the dry bulb temperature they are all coincident So this is what I was just talking about and I briefed you about that and uh, what we will do we will continue with this in the next class by taking up some examples where we will make use of the mathematical results that we have obtained to find out the various properties and also use the sacramentic chart to verify those properties I would encourage you to use the to get familiar with the use of the psychrometric chart you can yourself take up uh, print out the psychrometric chart add a mark a state and then find out the unknown properties at that particular state so that's all for today and we will continue with this in the next class